and welcome to History Now. On today's show, we're just going to look at memory and commemoration, among other things. And joining me today, Dr. Jonathan Evershed, who'll be talking about his book, Ghosts of the Psalm, and Dr. Gareth Mulvana, who's going to talk to us about his book on Tartan Gangs. So welcome to the show. Um, th this first question, I'm just going to address to both of you because there is a certain amount of overlap mm. in your, your work, which I found very interesting, but there's slightly different perspectives. So there seems to me that there's a lot of imbalance on, you know, when we're looking at our history um, between probably, say, the Republican side and the Loyalist side. Yeah, yeah. Yours deals with that. So if I could just ask you first, uh, Jonathan, what drew you to your topic? It's a really good question. And I suppose what drew me to the topic was, uh, in a way, precisely uh, that imbalance that you're suggesting. And in particular, um, I was uh, inspired by um, a book called uh, Remembering and Forgetting 1916 by Rebecca Graf McRae. Um, her theoretical um, framework in particular, which, and that book deals with the Easter Rising, its commemoration, its political legacies. And reading that book, I thought, first of all, wow, this is a really, you know, novel and fascinating way of interrogating the politics of commemoration, which is what Ghosts of the Somme deals with. But in particular, thinking, you know, it would be fascinating to turn this lens, if you like, uh, and examine the other side of the story, um, the, the Somme and its role in kind of unionist and loyalist politics, which was, if you like, a kind of conspicuous gap. Personally, why I was drawn to this was visiting Northern Ireland for the, for the first time which was in 2012, I think, and it was, it was just before the flag protests. It, you can't not but be struck by that imagery and that resonance of the Somme, which to me as someone from the British mainland, if you like, coming over and seeing that preponderance of kind of Somme imagery, Somme symbolism, that figure of the First World War soldier, it was something that was both quite alien, but also very familiar. And I was just really intrigued by the role that the Somme seemed to play in the kind of culture and politics of this community, which f for my sins and, and for the sins of the British uh, education or the, 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 well, the wider British education system, we just knew nothing about, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, it was that, if you like, sort of that absence and that lack of my own understanding that really drew me to wanting to explore um, the politics of loyalism and particularly the role of the Somme within that, that politics. And Gareth, just similar question to you, but of course you're you're from here, so it's it's probably a different perspective than yeah. Jonathan's. Yeah, so I've talked a bit about it before, but um, I'd done my PhD at Queen's, finished it in 2009. It was on the Protestant working class experience of the pre-Troubles period, right through the conflict and up to uh, the post-agreement era. Um, you know, I'd always been fascinated by the footnotes that mentioned the Tartan gangs and the sort of uh, myths that surrounded them as a youth subculture, and I'd wondered why nobody had ever sort of fully explored the story on its own. Um, so I just basically thought this is a fascinating story. It's part of the early Troubles history. It can perhaps explain maybe some of the things that were going on within the Protestant working class youth um, at the time, and why they uh, sort of coalesced with the paramilitaries um, that were emerging in the early 70s. I mean, the book's only, well, I say only, but it's 260 pages. I mean, you could have written tw twice that amount. Um, so we had to sort of skirt through a lot of um, the 1960s history. And again, a lot of the 1960s material in terms of loyalism is quite uh, sketchy when it comes to the formation of the UVF and the politicians that were perhaps behind it. Um, there's a few names that I'll not mention for, for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, I mean, that 1960s period and it ties in with me what Jonathan's looked at in terms of commemoration. Obviously, you had the commemoration of uh, the Easter Rising and there were fears how tangible they were in, in terms of the actual threat, I'm not sure, but there were certainly, Gusty Spence has talked about how he received information that um, the IRA were going to stage a coup and take over the city hall. There was also stuff going on with Jerry Fitz's election at the time. There were um, sort of allegations that there was election fraud going on. Unionist politicians weren't happy about that. But I think in, in terms of the Tartan gangs and the, and the generation I was looking at, 1966 obviously is a pivotal year in terms of the UVF committing the first murders of the, of the present troubles. 
Um, but the one thing that we'll have to bear in mind is that a lot of the people I talked to were only maybe nine or ten at that stage. I mean, the only one who was directly involved in in, in that uh, in that period in 1966 would have been Frankie Curry, who obviously died a number of years ago, or was killed a number of years ago. He would have been Gusty Spence's nephew, and he claims that he carried the weapons to a safe house at the time. So, I mean, he was only 13 at the time. But a lot of the other guys weren't involved at all. I mean, uh, one of the things in the book is uh, a former Tartan gang member who was out watching the bonfire in, in the area that he lived in, in the Shankle, and hearing the cracks of the gunshots from Malvern Street, and thinking it was just bonfire wood falling over. So, and people weren't really uh, expecting this, this level of violence. And indeed, after the Malvern Street uh, shootings, I think there was a lot of shame mm -hmm. in the Shankle, because murder was just so uncommon in Northern Ireland at the time. But although there was a backlash against Gusty Spence and, and the UVF at that time, by the early 1970s, when the younger generation that I looked at were coming through, he was seen as a folk hero, and people were saying, well, perhaps he was right. Yeah, it's, um, yeah there's, it's a real sort of rapid sort of deterioration of, yeah. of society. But if we can go to you, Jonathan, there's um, a thing here, and some, some of our viewers mightn't be familiar with this sort of academic um, <laughs> to and fro, for want of a better word, uh -huh. and this history versus memory. So could you explain to us, our viewers, what history versus memory is and how it, you know, your work figures in that? So <laughs> my central contention is basically that um, Ireland has something of a, uh, a problem with historians, and some of my best friends are historians, so um, this isn't meant to be um, a kind of sideswipe at history and, and historians. But what we've seen during the decade of centenaries is um, often historians are invited to, or there's an assumption that commemoration and um, particularly during this decade of centenaries, there's been an assumption that commemoration is really a subject for historians. So we see that, for example, in the South, the Decade of Centenaries advisory group, the expert group, consists, at one stage, it consisted entirely of academic historians, um, but that, that might have changed now, I'm not, I'm not sure. But certainly it's dominated by historians and by history. But actually, historians, I would argue, don't always get commemoration, they don't get how memory works. Um, and often historians, so during this kind of decade of centenaries, we've seen often historians being invited to comment on what's being commemorated. And they're invited to explain the event that is being commemorated. But a central contention of my book uh, and of uh, kind of wider work by social scientists on this subject is that actually explaining the event that's being commemorated and understanding more about, for example, the Easter Rising or the Battle of the Somme doesn't actually tell us very much about why that event is being commemorated. And in order to understand how an event is being commemorated, you have to look, and, and how it's being commemorated, you have to look at social and political conditions in the present. So actually understanding how and why the Somme has resonances for loyalism in the political present is, I think, something that requires a sociological or, or in, in my case, an anthropological lens to try and understand how loyalists understand the social and political processes that they're enrolled in um, and why, therefore, the form or why the Somme is commemorated and the particular ways in which it's commemorated is much more about the political present. In fact, it's entirely about the political present and has very little to do or is disconnected from the actual, if you like, history of the event of the Somme itself. So in a nutshell, and as I say, this uh, argument I hope is made somewhat more coherently, certainly by Dominic Bryan and, and hopefully also in my own book is that commemoration has almost nothing to do with history and it has everything to do with politics and social processes in the present. Yeah. Thanks and Gareth, what Jonathan has said there about the political and social present mm -hmm. and you know the history, those elements together, 
in 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 your book, I I get the feeling that you know history weighs. There's a lot of weight of history on those people that you looked at, especially in around what you say about the the 50th anniversary of the the rising yeah. in 1966. Would that be fair to say that the pressure not only of that era of history, but going back to what Jonathan mainly looks at, the psalm, um, that the weight of that history is on that generation too? I think it depends really. I think at, at, the, uh, at the period that I looked at in the early 70s, it, it, I don't think, w when you talk to people who were there, obviously they understood what the psalm meant. They understood the effect that it had on their, on their community in terms of their maybe grandparents or whatever. But in terms of how it affected what was going on at the time with uh, sort of IRA violence and that type of thing, I don't think it really meant that much. Um, the uh, young fellows who were in the Tartan gangs and who formed the Red Hand and were involved in the UVF and UDA would have been reacting to what was going on in the present, just as, as Jonathan outlines. It's all about the present. The legitimacy for maybe what they are involved in can be sought in the antecedent um, factors like World War One, the Somme and that type of thing. I think it is part of the collective memory and collective uh, identity, but I think it's of secondary concern in the early 70s to what was actually going on in the streets. I mean, I think uh, talking to people at that stage, and I know Bino Niblock, who I've worked closely with, was showing a um, piece of writing to his uh, son, and it was a list of things that had happened, bombings, shootings, this type of thing, and it was one of these almanac type magazines. Um, and he said to his son, do you notice anything about this? And his son said, yeah, it all happened in March 72. And he said, no, look closely. And he said it looked all happened on the same day. Mm. So it wasn't, you know, a sort of month by month mm. breakdown of all the shootings and bombings. Um, armed robberies type of things, it all happened in one day. So this was going on day, day after day after day. So people were just responding to that. Mm -hmm. Then obviously with the UVF, there is a historical identity. Mainly, uh, I think Gusty Spence would have been the, the driving force behind that when he was um, you know, on, on the run in 1972. He reformed the UVF. It already had a coherent structure, but he sort of gave it that identity to match it with the World War I UVF and then Obviously, the setting up of the Young Citizen Volunteers. Um, Billy Hutchinson would have been involved in that. Um, you know, uh, Gusty's brother would have been involved in that. Um, so it was all sort of encouraging the young fellows to appreciate the history. And I think um, at the time, it might not have been an intricate knowledge of what had gone on, but it definitely gave a sense of purpose to what they were doing at that time. So, Jonathan, if we can just go back to you. In your book, there's a, a number of themes run as mm -hmm. particularly the psalm and how it impacted from the beginning of the mm -hmm. state. Um, could you just, I know it's a, it's a, it's a probably a big ask, but from the beginning of the state, right up until where you're talking mm -hmm. about the cult of the centenary, how commemoration maybe has changed for uh, loyalists? Yeah, I'll certainly try. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the book is called Ghosts of the Somme and, and it's called that deliberately because I argue that um, the men of the 36th Ulster Division are the kind of ghosts that haunt uh, the politics of unionism, loyalism, but the politics of, of Northern Ireland more, um, more generally in that what they do is um, point to a future in which their descendants will be or feel safe on this corner of the island of Ireland, uh, safe in their identity and uh, and you know physically secure and safe. And at various points in the history of the state, normally when the state has been experiencing some kind of crisis um, or um, some kind of uncer or loyalism. Uh, or indeed unionism more widely has been experiencing some kind of moment of insecurity, these ghosts tend to kind of um, be evoked or invoked or conjured to, to try and create that sense of safety and security. And we have that right from the get-go with the foundation of the state of Northern Ireland. So the Ulster Tower um, in, in uh, just outside of Thiepval uh, on the Somme battlefield was the first permanent 
battlefield memorial to be built on the former battlefield. It predates the memorial to the missing, the Menin Gate, and all of these other memorial sites or sites of memory on the on the battlefields. And an argument I make in the book, and that others indeed have made before me, uh, is that that was quite deliberate because what the goat, what the Somme represents, or and what the men of the 36th Ulster Division kind of come to represent is the kind of founding sacrifice for the state of Northern Ireland. And that tower, that Ulster Tower is a kind of memorial, uh, a kind of physical memorialization of that founding sacrifice. Um, we then have um, the institution of the um, 1st of July commemoration at Belfast City Hall, uh, which begins, I think, in 1919 is the first one. Uh, and that uh, ceremony has, has continued. Uh, it continued throughout the duration of the Troubles. Um, and the, the wording of the resolution that's adopted every 1st of July up until very recently is all about, uh, again, that sacrifice of the 36th Ulster Division, specifically the men of the 36th Ulster Division at the Somme in order to guarantee and secure Northern Ireland's place within, first of all, the British Empire and then the Commonwealth. So the, there's already a slight change of wording uh, towards the kind of 1950s and 60s. We then have the adoption of the of the Somme and its symbolism in in ways that Gareth's talked about by by the EVF. Again, I think at least as much in part as uh, at least as much a response to the kind of escalating violence of the Troubles as as a cause of that violence. And then what's quite interesting is that the Somme sort of, and I, and I say this hesitantly, sort of disappears a little bit partly because there are frankly other things for everyone else, to, for everyone to be worrying about. Philip Orr has written about in the 1980s wanting to write the book, The Road to the Somme, precisely because he thought that these stories about the Somme were starting to disappear with the men who had, who had actually fought there. And then what happens is a kind of resurgence of the Somme story. And, and I trace it, I think, um, not unlike Gareth has to Gusty Spence and his particular project uh, in the cages of Longkesh and, and outside, but also the Drum Cree dispute in the 1990s. Um, and I've written about how the Drum Cree dispute kind of employs the language and the symbolism of the Somme to make particular kinds of claims about, about the political present. But at the same time, you also have the Somme then being kind of repurposed alongside other battles like Messines in particular to tell this kind of new reconciliatory story about the First World War, the 36th and the 16th, now are commemorated together, unionism and nationalism commemorated together, this kind of coming together of orange and green on the battlefields of the Western Front. And that exists, I think, in a little bit of conflict and tension with the ongoing importance of the Somme as a kind of uniquely unionist or, or loyalist story or set of symbols. Yeah. Gareth, your book's obviously about t tartan gangs primarily, yeah. but you look at previous gang culture yeah. in in Northern Ireland at the you know not even uh, before partition as yeah, well, you in know, the north of Ireland, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, and clans they yeah. were called. Yeah, uh, there's some reference to Thomas Carnduff yeah. there in it. Could you tell us about that and what parallels you you maybe see there? Well, funny, just before you know, over the weekend, it was revisiting that part of the book to remind myself what, what I'd actually written because it's been quite a while um, from that part of the book. But yeah, I mean, even looking at that now, it, it, it looks like it could be a fascinating study of its own. I sort of wish someone would write a book about that. It's not going to be me, just, just to make that clear. I don't have the time. But basically, uh, you had these, um, Thomas Carnduff in his memoirs um, and, and, and early poetry, he talks about the clan system in Belfast how he was involved in a clan called the Pass Clan. And these clans were basically groups of young men, um, teenagers, and they fought with each other because they were of a different religion. He talks about the, the Cronji Clan, I think it's the Cronji Clan, from the Falls Road, and how um, they and the 40 thieves from, I think it was the Shore Road, would fight each other. And as Thomas Carnduff says, when the 40 thieves arrived in the city centre, it would be a sign for everyone to get offside because they knew there was going to be trouble. So basically, young men particularly always fought with each other in industrialised cities. 
I mean, at the time, shortly after that, you had the Peaky Blinders, which is obviously very popular now in, in Birmingham. Um, different gangs in Manchester, Glasgow. Glasgow gangs are notorious. But you know, the, the one that I really enjoyed was Thomas Carndoff talking about the uh, relief of Ladysmith in 1900 and how he talks about, you know, um, they were celebrating this the, the victory for the British um, in the Boer War. And he talks about the Catholic community, as he describes it, naturally being pro-Boer, came out on the side of the, 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 the Boer um, people. And basically that there was a collision in Kent Street um, and they were f throwing stones at each other and fighting fist to fist. And obviously, if people know the geography of Belfast, Kent Street is in the sort of periphery of the city centre near where Unity Flats was built and the Lower Shankill and Lower Falls area. So, and, you know, 70 years later, this is where the trouble escalated, you know, between um, Republicans and Nationalists at Unity Flats and Linfield fans coming back from uh, games at Windsor Park. And that's where a lot of the worst violence started um, at that interface. And obviously it went on to be notorious for, you know, where the Shankill Butchers, for example, would um, pick up a lot of their victims. But basically, yeah, I mean, Karndorf, we know Karndorf isn't sectarian, we know Karndorf matured as, as he went on. He wrote some fantastic poetry and, 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 and plays about his experience of, of, of life in the working class community of Belfast. But he was very candid in his des description of, um, of those fights. And he, he, he basically said, you know, our quarry was Catholics and we loved to slaughter them. Not literally, but, you know, with fists and fights. So, yeah, I mean, there'd always been that history. and. Um, so it, it really shouldn't have been a surprise that uh, when the troubles emerged and there was already gang culture on the streets that they coalesced and became a very uh, formidable force. Jonathan, uh, if we can just, just quickly move on to mm -hmm. um, the 50th anniversary which you talk about. Uh, Ian McBride, mm. you know, we're talking about commemoration. There's a, a quote in your book where it says, you know, Irish commemorations have always a habit of making history. Yeah. You know, in the, f the 50th anniversary, Gareth has spoken about, you know, the, the, the very real thought of, mm -hmm. you know, Republican violence coming along to, to mark the 50th anniversary. When you're looking at the centenary, did you get any sense of people were thinking, you know, there's some other history going to be made here? I think that's a really good question. And um, it's one I've been thinking about a lot um, and we may I, I, I think we're going to come on to kind of talk a, a bit more about what's happened kind of since uh, the centenaries and, and what else happened in that centenary year that, as I say, commemoration is, is fundamentally shaped by the political context uh, in which it takes place. I feel it's funny coming onto a show called History Now to be rude about historians. <laughs> that, wasn't my, that wasn't my intention. Um, and the, and I, I, I want to say, which I should have said, which there are a lot of historians that do get this, but fundamentally commemoration is shaped by the political context in, in which it takes place. And I, I previously mentioned that my, you know, I arrived um, in Belfast just before, uh, for my first ever visit, just before uh, the, the outbreak of the flag protests. Um, and I began my field work just after them if you like. So it's kind of my first experiences of, the, of this city were, were kind of bookended by those, by those uh, protests. And those protests obviously revealed in, in very tangible ways the kind of alienation that's felt by working class unionism, by loyalism uh, in ways that have you know, been dissected elsewhere. And I, and I really had a sense of that when I was doing my work on the centenaries of, of what these centenaries were trying to say in response to that alienation, uh, the kinds of conflict that they kind of created within the kind of wider, if you like, Protestant unionist loyalist family um, and tensions in between the Orange Order and, and those that would be associated, for example, with it, more of the kind of paramilitary loyalist tradition. I really had a sense of that uh, and a sense that there was this real uh, will among, uh, you know, at government level uh, and in wider civil society to not to replicate the perceived mistakes of, of the 1960s. Now, I think those mistakes are, are overblown and, and in ways that we've already talked about. I don't think that those commemorations played the role 
mm. in, in precipitating conflict here that it's, that it's often suggested that they did or has come to be thought that they did. But I certainly had an awareness and developed a very acute awareness through that kind of immersive ethnographic methodology that I employ, employed of, of the, the politics of alienation among loyalists um, and, uh, and how that changed and transitioned between 2012, 2013 and 2016. And there was a, there was a big, you know, the, the um, Twadel parades in past, for example, was a big, was a big factor uh, in, in loyalist and, and wider Northern Irish politics when I started that had gone away mm. effectively by 2016, only to be replaced by other political concerns which have emerged since, which undoubtedly will shape the commemorations and the centenaries to come, I yeah, think. Yeah. You mentioned it previously there about the football element. There's, yeah. there's football plays a big part in one of the chapters in your book yeah. and the violence around that. Yeah. But if we can just go on sort of to, towards when paramilitarism took off, what happened to the Tartan gangs? Can you tell us, you know, it, was it like a wholesale joining of paramilitaries from Tartan gangs or was, you know, what um, way did that work out? Not, not really, no. Uh, basically, you would have had certain groups, even, you know, the book became a, a story of the wood, an element of the Woodstock Tartan who joined the Red Hand Commando that cut across the book. It wasn't something I'd anticipated, but when I was given access to certain people, who were involved in setting up the Red Hand Commando, it became a, a story I just couldn't ignore. So you had a group of the Woodstock Tartan who joined the Red Hand Commando, you had a group of the Tartan who joined um, the UDA. Obviously Max Hastings made that documentary in May 1972, and the two guys he interviewed were UDA. Apparently they were attracted to join the UDA at that stage because they, they, wanted, they were given rank. So young men were given rank, and it was as simple as that. Others joined the UVF. So to take that as an example, that's three, three core groups who joined different organizations. Then a lot of the other guys would have just fallen away, gone into domestic life, um, given up the gang culture, like a lot of gangs generally. You know, young fellows grow out of violence, they go on and get married, settle down. Um, in terms of the actual tartan, it has, I think it has a resurrection, a sort of reinvigoration around the Ulster Workers' Council strike in May 1974. And that's why there's a lot of sort of confusion around the per, uh, perception that the Tartan gangs were only associated with the UDA because I think they galvanized the UDA in 74 at that stage. Then beyond that, in the late 70s, you still have Tartan graffiti, SYT, you know, rules, Woodstock Tartan, all that sort of thing, but I think Really, by that stage, it really is just a, a, a sort of motif on the wall. But interesting when we're talking about commemoration here, I know um, one of the bands that are um, quite popular, uh, Pride, Pride of the Shore, um, who are from the Shore Road area, they would um, incorporate that tartan um, sort of imagery and motto into their band, band uniform in the present. And they're quite proud of reclaiming that. And I've actually noticed, I don't know if it's something on the back of the book or it was always there. I think, I think it must be on the back of the book that there's been a resurgence in, in interest in the Tartan gangs in terms of, you know, reclaiming that identity and, and trying to sort of bring it into the, the uh, band, band culture and, and that type of thing. So again, I mean, it, that's, that's good in a way because it, it means people are acknowledging that part of their history and incorporating it into, into the memory. But uh, really the Tartan gangs died out, I think, I mean, People talk about the Bay City Rollers link. I mean, that's that's 1974. A lot of the guys I talked to had left the Tartan behind in 1971, 72. So yeah, I mean, it was a very brief movement, but obviously, obviously very pivotal in in that violent era. Yeah, Gareth, Jonathan, thanks very much Thank for coming you. in. Really Thank enjoyed you, that. Cheers. Thank thanks. you.